Story twenty five of thirty ghost stories by various authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bridal Party by S. McCurgy. In Benares, the sacred city of the Hindus, situated in the United Provinces of Agra and Oud, there is a house which is famed pretty far and wide. It is said that the house is haunted and that no human being can pass a night in that house. Once there was a large bridal party. In India, the custom is that the bridegroom goes to the house of the bride with great pomp and show with a number of friends and followers, and the ceremony of Kanya Dan, giving way the girl, takes place at the bride's house. The number of people who go with the bridegroom largely depends on the means of the bride's party, because the guests who come with the groom are to be fed and entertained in the right regal style. It is this feeding and entertaining of the guests that makes a daughter's marriage so costly in India, to a certain extent. If the bride and the groom live in the same town or village, then the bridegroom's party goes to the bride's house in the evening. The marriage is performed at night, and they all come away the same night or early the next morning. If, however, the places of residence of the bride and the bridegroom are, say, 500 miles apart, as is generally the case. The bridegroom with his party goes a day or two earlier and stays a day or two after the marriage. The bride's people have to find accommodation, food, and entertainment for the whole period, which in the case of rich people extends over a week. Now I had the pleasure of joining such a bridal party as mentioned last, going to Benares. We were about thirty young men, besides a number of elderly people, since the young men could not be merry in the presence of their elders, the bride's father, who was a very rich man, had made arrangements to put up the thirty of us in a separate house. This house was within a few yards of the famed haunted house. We reached Benares at about ten in the morning, and it was about three in the afternoon that we were informed that the celebrated haunted house was close by. Naturally, some of us decided that we should occupy that house rather than the one in which we were. I myself was not very keen on shifting, but a few others were. Our host protested, but we insisted, and so the host had to give way. The house was empty and the owner was a local gentleman, a resident of Benares. To procure his permission and the key was the work of a few minutes and we took actual possession of the house at about six in the evening. It was a very large house with big rooms and halls, rather poorly furnished, but some furniture was brought in from the house which we had occupied on our arrival. There was a very big and well-ventilated hall, and in this we decided to sleep. Carpet upon carpet was piled on the floor, and there we decided to sleep, on the ground, in right oriental style. Lamps were brought and the house was lighted up. At about 9 p.m. our dinner was announced. The Oriental dinner is conducted as follows. All guests sit on the floor and a big plate of metal, say 20 inches in diameter, is placed in front of each guest. Then the service commences and the plates are filled with dainties. Each guest generally gets thrice as much as he can eat. Then the host, who does not himself join, stands with joined hands and requests the guests to do full justice, and the dinner begins. Very little is eaten, in fact, and whatever is left over goes to the poor. That is probably the only consolation. Now on this particular occasion, the bride's father, who was our host and who was an elderly gentleman, had withdrawn, leaving two of his sons to look after us. He himself, we understood, was looking after his more elderly guests who had been lodged in a different house. The hall in which we sat down to dine was a large one and very well lighted. Adjoining it was a hall in which our beds had been made. The sons of mine host, with a number of others, were serving. I always was rather unconventional, so I asked my fellow guests whether I could fall too and without waiting for permission, I commenced eating. A very good thing I did, as would appear hereafter. In about twenty minutes the serving was over and we were asked to begin. 
as a matter of fact i was nearly half through at that time and then the trouble began with a click all the lights went out and the whole house was in total darkness of course the reader can guess what followed who has put out the lights shouted jagad who was sitting next but one to me on the left the ghost shouted another in reply i shall kill him if i can catch him shouted jagad the whole place was in darkness we could not see anything but we could hear that jagat was trying to get up then he received what was a stunning blow on his back we could hear the thump oh shouted jagat who is that he sat down again and gave the man on his right a blow like the one he had received the man on the right protested then jagat turned to the man on his left the man on Jagat's left evidently resisted and Jagat had the worst of it. Then Narin, another one of us, shouted out, "'What is the matter with you?' asked his neighbor. "'Why did you pull my hair?' shouted Narin. "'I did not pull,' shouted the neighbor. Then a servant was seen approaching with a lamp and things became quiet. But the servant did not reach the hall. He stumbled against something and fell headlong on the ground. The lamp went out, and our trouble began again. One of the party received a slap on the back of his head, which sent his cap rolling, and in his attempt to recover it, he upset a glass of water that was near his right hand. Matters went on in this fashion till a lamp came. The whole thing must have taken about four minutes. When the lamp came, we found that all the dishes were clean. The edibles had mysteriously disappeared. The sons of mine host looked stupidly at us, and we looked stupidly at them and at each other. But there it was, there was not a particle of solid food left. We had therefore no alternative but to adjourn to the nearest confectioner's shop and eat some sweets there. That night would not pass in peace, we were sure, but nobody dared suggest that we should not pass the night in the haunted house. Once having defied the ghost, we had to stand to our guns for one night at least. It was well after eleven o'clock at night when we came back and went to bed. We went to bed but could not sleep. The room in which we all slept was a big one, as I have already said, and there were two wall lamps in it. We lowered the lamps and, then the lamps went out, and we began to anticipate trouble. Our hosts had all gone home, leaving us to the tender mercies of the ghost. Shortly afterwards we began to feel as if we were lying on a public road, and horses passing along the road within a yard of us. We also imagined we could hear men passing close to us whispering. Sleeping was impossible. We all remained awake, talking about different things, till a horse came very near. And thus the night passed away. At about four in the morning one of us got up and wanted to go out. We shouted for the servant called Kalu, and within a minute Kalu came with a lantern. One of our fellow guests got up and went out of the room, followed by Kalu. We could hear him going along the dining hall to the head of the stairs. Then we heard him shriek. We all rushed out. The lighted lantern was there at the head of the stairs, and our fellow guest at the bottom. Kalu had vanished. We rushed down, picked up our friend, and carried him upstairs. He said that Kalu had given him a push and he had fallen down. Fortunately, he was not hurt. We called the servants and they all came, Kalu among them. He denied having come with a lantern or having pushed our friend down the stairs. The other servants corroborated his statement. They assured us that Kalu had never left the room in which they all were. We were satisfied that this was also a ghostly trick. At about seven in the morning when our hosts came, we were glad to bid goodbye to the haunted house with our bones whole. The funniest thing was that only those of my fellow guests had the worst of it who had denied the existence of ghosts. Those of us who had kept respectfully silence had not been touched. Those who had received a blow or two averred that the blows could not have been given by invisible hands, inasmuch the blows were too substantial. But all of us were certain that it was no trick played by a human being. 
the passing horses and the whispering passers-by had given us a queer creepy sensation in this connection may be mentioned a few haunted houses in other parts of india there are one or two very well-known haunted houses in calcutta the hastings house is one of them it is situated at alipur in the southern suburb of calcutta this is a big palatial building now owned by the government of bengal at one time it was the private residence of the governor-general of india whose name it bears at present it is used as the state guest house in which the indian chiefs are put up when they come to pay official visits to his excellency in calcutta it appears that in a lane not very far from this house was fought the celebrated duel between warren hastings the first governor-general of india and sir philip francis a member of his council and the reputed author of the letters of junius while living in this house warren hastings married baroness imhoff some time during the first fortnight of august about one hundred and forty years ago the event was celebrated by great festivities and as expected the bride came home in a splendid equipage it is said that this scene is reenacted on the anniversary of the wedding by supernatural agency and a ghostly carriage duly enters the gate in the evening once every year the clatter of hoofs and the rattle of iron tired wheels are distinctly heard advancing up to the portico then there is the sound of the opening and closing of the carriage door and lastly the carriage proceeds onwards but does not come out from under the porch it vanishes mysteriously today is the fifteenth of august and this famous equipage must have glided in and out to the utter bewilderment of watchful eyes and ears within the last fortnight there is another well-known ghostly house in calcutta in which the only trouble is that its windows in the first-floor bedrooms open at night spontaneously people have slept at night for a reward in this house closing the windows with their own hands and have waked up at night shivering with cold to find all the windows open once a body of soldiers went to pass a night in this house with a view to solve the mystery they all sat in a room fully determined not to sleep but see what happened and thus went on chatting till it was about midnight there was a big lamp burning on the table around which they were seated all of a sudden there was a loud click the lamp went out and all the windows opened simultaneously the next minute the lamp was alight again the occupants of the room looked at their watches it was about one a m the next night they sat up again and one of them with a revolver at about one in the morning this particular individual pointed his revolver at one of the windows as soon as the lamp went out this man pulled the trigger five times and there were five reports the windows however opened and the lamp was alight again as on the previous night they all rushed to the window to see if any damage had been done by the bullets the five bullets were found in the room but from their appearance it seemed as if they had struck nothing evidently the bullets would have been changed in shape if they had impinged upon any hard surface but then this was another enigma how did the bullets come back no man could have put the bullets there from before for they were still hot when discovered or could have guessed the bore of the revolver that was going to be used on the third night to make assurance doubly sure these soldiers were again present in the room but on this occasion they had loaded their revolver with marked bullets. As it neared one o'clock, one of them pointed the revolver at the window. He had decided to pull the trigger as soon as the lamp would go out, but he could not. As soon as the lamp went out, this soldier received a sharp cut on his wrist with a cane, and the revolver fell clattering onto the floor. The invisible hand had left its mark behind which his companion saw after the lamp was alight again. Many people have subsequently tried to solve the mystery, but never succeeded. The house remained untenanted for a long time, and finally it was rented by an Australian horse dealer, who, however, did not venture to occupy the building itself, 
and contented himself with erecting his stables and offices in the compound where he is not molested by the unearthly visitors. There is another ghostly house, and it is in the United Provinces. The name of the town has been intentionally omitted. Various people saw numerous things in that house, but a correct report never came. Once a friend of mine passed a night in that house. He told me what he had seen. Most wonderful, and I have no reason to disbelieve him. I went to pass a night in that house, and I had only a comfortable chair, a small table, and a few magazines besides a loaded revolver. I had taken care to load that revolver myself so that there might be no trick, and I had given everybody to understand that. I began well. The night was cool and pleasant, the lamp bright, the chair comfortable, and the magazine which I took up interesting. But at about midnight I began to feel rather uneasy. At one in the morning I should probably have left the place if I had not been afraid of friends whose servants I knew were watching the house and its front door. At half past one I heard a peculiar sigh of pain in the next room. This is rather interesting, I thought. To face something tangible is comparatively easy. To wait for the unknown is much more difficult. I took out the revolver from my pocket and examined it. It looked quite all right, this small piece of metal which could have killed six men in half a minute. Then I waited. For what? Well, a couple of minutes of suspense and the sigh was repeated. I went to the door dividing the two rooms and pushed it open. A long, thick ray of light at once penetrated the darkness, and I walked into the other room. It was only partially light. But after a minute I could see all the corners. There was nothing in that room. I waited for a minute or two. Then I heard the sigh in the room which I had left. I came back, stopped, rubbed my eyes. Sitting in the chair which I had vacated not two minutes ago was a young girl, calm, fair, beautiful with that painful expression on her face, which could be more easily imagined than described. I had heard of her. So many others who had come to pass a night in that house had seen her and described her, and I had disbelieved. Well, there she sat, calm, sad, beautiful, in my chair. If I had come in five minutes later, I might have found her reading the magazine which I had left open, face downwards. When I was well within the room, she stood up facing me, and I stopped. The revolver fell from my hand. She smiled a sad, sweet smile. How beautiful she was! Then she spoke, a modern ghost speaking like Hamlet's father. Just think of that! You will probably wonder why I am here. I shall tell you. I was murdered by my own father. I was a young widow living in this house which belonged to my father. I became unchaste, and to save his own name he poisoned me when I was in saint. Another week and I should have become a mother, but he poisoned me and my innocent child died too. It would have been such a beautiful baby, and you would probably want to kiss it. And horrors of horrors, she took out the child from her womb and showed it to me. She began to move in my direction with the child in her arms, saying, You will like to kiss it. I don't know whether I shouted, but I fainted. When I recovered consciousness it was broad daylight, and I was lying on the floor, with the revolver by my side. I picked it up and slowly walked out of the house with as much dignity as I could command. At the door I met one of my friends to whom I told a lie that I had seen nothing. It is the first time that I have told you what I saw in that place. The ghostly woman spoke the language of the part of the country in which the ghostly house is situate. The friend who told me this story is a responsible government official and will not make a wrong statement. What has been written above has been confirmed by others, who had passed nights in that ghostly house, but they had generally shouted for help and fainted at the sight of the ghost and so they had not heard her story from her lips as reproduced here. The house still exists, but it is now a dilapidated old affair, 
and the roof and doors and windows are so bad that people don't care to go and pass the night there. There is also a haunted house in Assam. In this house a certain gentleman committed suicide by cutting his own throat with a razor. You often see him sitting on a cot in the veranda, heaving deep sighs. Mention of this house has been made in a book called Tales from the Tiger Land, published in England. The author says he has passed a night in the house in question and testifies to the accuracy of all the rumors that are current. Talking about haunted houses reminds me of a haunted tank. I was visiting a friend of mine in the interior of Bengal during our annual summer holidays when I was yet a student. This friend of mine was the son of a rich man and in the village had a large ancestral house where his people usually resided. It was the first week of June when I reached my friend's house. I was informed that among other things of interest, which were, however, very few in that particular part of the country, there was a large puka tank belonging to my friend's people which was haunted. What kind of ghost lived in a tank or near it nobody could say, but what everybody knew was this. Of course, Jaistha Shukla Ekadashi was only three days off, I decided to prolong my stay at my friend's place, so that I too might have a look at the ghost's bath. On the eventful day I resolved to pass the night with my friend and two other intrepid souls near the tank. After a rather late dinner, we started with a bedding and a hookah and a pack of cards and a big lamp. We made the bed, a mattress and a sheet, on a platform on the bank. There were six steps, with risers about nine inches each, leading from the platform to the water. Thus we were about four and a half feet from the water level, and from this coin of advantage we could command a full view of the tank, which covered an area of about four acres. Then we began our game of cards. There was a servant with us who was preparing our hookah. At midnight we felt we could play no longer. The strain was too great, the interest too intense. We sat smoking and chatting and asked the servant to remove the lamp as a lot of insects was coming near attracted by the light. As a matter of fact, we did not require any light because there was a brilliant moon. At one o'clock in the morning there was a noise as of rushing wind. We looked round and found that not a leaf was moving but still the whizzing noise as of a strong wind continued. Then we found something advancing towards the tank from the opposite bank. There was a number of coconut trees on the bank on the other side, and in the moonlight we could not see clearly what it really was. It looked like a huge white elephant. It approached the bank at a rapid pace, say the pace of a fast-trotting horse. From the bank it took a long leap and with a tremendous splash fell into the water. The plunge made the water rise on our side and it rose as high as four and a half feet because we got wet through and through. The mattress and the sheet and all our clothes were wet. In the confusion we forgot to keep our eyes on the ghost or white elephant or whatever it was and when again we looked in that direction everything was quiet. The apparition had vanished. The most wonderful thing was the rise in the water level. For the water to raise four and a half feet would have been impossible under ordinary circumstances, even if a thousand elephants had gotten into the water. We were all wide awake. We went home immediately because we required a change of clothes. The old man, my friend's father, was waiting for us. Well, you are wet, he said. Yes, said we. Rightly served, said the old man. He did not ask what had happened. We were told subsequently that he had got wet like us a number of times when he was a youngster himself. End of story 25